The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on under our University Startup Development webinar series. And today's topic is on Fortune 500 corporations, how they think about partnering with startups. So thank you, everyone, for joining us again. And we hope that you find this webinar useful. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to let everyone know that we have um, two more webinars lined up in this series. On November 8th, we are going to talk about what every startup should know to avoid financing pitfalls. And on December 6th, building a management and leadership team and a board of directors and advisors. So we hope that um, people on the call or those registered for this webinar series can tune in for these webinars and you know, we'd like to enjoin your colleagues to join you as well. We will have Q&A at the end. So if you look at your GoToWebinar control panel, you should see a questions box where you could type in your questions to the staff. Uh, questions will be queued up first in, first out. So hopefully we get through as many questions as we can um, in this afternoon session. This session is being recorded. So um, you will expect an email from us uh, after the webinar that the slides and, vi uh, and video will be available 24 to 48 hours after the webinar concludes. You can also access past webinars in this series as well as other webinars that we've done uh, through our YouTube channel. All you need to do is go to nsitute.org backslash YouTube. So today's agenda, we're going to talk about, you know, what this webinar series is about, just to give you a little more background about what we're planning to do here, as well as the startup development program. This webinar series is actually a series of, um, of topics that um, fall under our startup development program. And we'll, uh, you know, one of our speakers will talk to you a little bit more about that later. The third item on the agenda is about Fortune 500s and how they think about partnering with startups, which is our main event. And after that is the Q&A at the end. So before we proceed, uh, we'd like to let everyone know, everyone on the call, that if you'd like to engage with NZ2 and the startup development officers, there are two ways for you to do it. Uh, you can submit your IPR startups to NZ2. Just send an email to startupdevelopment at nz2.org so we can give you a copy of the application form um, as a sample so you can prepare the information once we um, open submissions. And if you'd like to become an NZ2 STO, and we'll talk about that later also, um, this is open to ex-corporates in open innovation, venture capital, uh, serial entrepreneurs, and active angel investors. You can send us a CV with a short note about wanting to be an SDO to startup development at nz2.org. And for these two topics, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that later. So again, welcome to today's webinar on how Fortune 500s uh, think about partnering with startups under this series. Our speakers today, so we'll start off with Dr. Glenn Vonk. He's our Director for Business Development and Alliances. And he is also a former corporate from um, uh, BD Tech. So he'll talk to you a little bit more about the startup development program. Then um, Michael Blaustein, who is our startup develop who is a startup development officer for NZ2, and he's the former director of venture capital for DuPont. And uh, Stephen uh, Freilich, he's now the director of corporate strategy a strategy of the University of Delaware Energy Institute. Both Michael and Steve will talk about um, uh, the, the main topic today on how Fortune 500 work with uh, startups. All right, so I'll turn it over now to Glenn to talk a little bit more about the startup development program and how universities and the other people in the call can participate in this program. Glenn. Thanks, Rhea. Uh, I will move through this fairly quickly. I know that some of you have seen it before. Uh, if you have questions about NSET2, um, ask them at the end or get in touch with us. Uh, the one thing to remember about NSET2 is that we focus on startups as the preferred commercialization or most efficient commercialization vehicle for university technologies. And I think that's what distinguishes us as an organization from others that you may be aware of. Our journey started out uh, working with university research organizations and with Congress approaching us 
seeking to understand how commercialization happens. We developed a model out of that, which was uh, uh, reviewed with uh, numerous organizations around the country with experience in university commercialization late 2015. It was taken back to Congress in 2016, and from that came uh, two demo days, which are a very way, efficient way for uh, universities to connect with corporates and for corporates to connect with universities. And basically what it is is uh, startups supply uh, information about who they are, what the business model is, all the things that a corporate would need to uh, assess interest in that startup. The corporates told us who they were interested in, and then they were featured at an investor's conference. Uh, we have realized since then that there's an activity that needs to happen after the interesting startups and promising startups have been identified that is inviting in the startup development officers program, which has been recently announced uh, uh, this year. And we've also begun working with universities uh, at an early stage to identify promising uh, intellectual property using some of the same mechanisms that we use to identify uh, interesting startups. And that intellectual property would again be moved uh, into startups for further development uh, as, a, as a startup, inviting startup. So Rhea, if I can go to the next slide. So this is the model that was initially developed, and uh, if you look at the top left, you can see that uh, there is funding from uh, both corporate and federal uh, agencies generating technology opportunities that are picked up by research, uh, researcher entrepreneurs. Uh, these often are um, developed into startups at universities in their startup programs. Uh, they have a significant amount of support in the universities and the best programs typically have uh, a corporate presence and an investor presence. We know that uh, startups that are housed within universities are six times more likely to succeed uh, than startups that are uh, run independently of universities. The Corporate Commercialization Council is a place for those startups to uh, connect with large corporates and then uh, moving together, they can identify gap funding sources and move towards uh, private funding and then eventually stand up as an independent organization or acquisition by a corporate entity. So that's uh, a fast run through the model as we see it. Next slide, please. So uh, all that said, uh, Congress is uh, spending 100 137 billion dollars now uh, to develop this research. Uh, it's an excellent opportunity for the researchers and entrepreneurs to build startups and um, to partner with uh, various entities that can help accelerate their progress towards commercializable uh, entities. Next slide, please. Uh, Startup development officers uh, typically supply leadership to startups at an early stage to assist those researchers and students as they create uh, and fund these early stage startups. Next slide, please. The uh, services that the startup development officers provide are assistance with business plans, proof of concept development, and that often benefits greatly from the participation of the corporate. Prototyping, early product development, funding uh, in the gap, commercialization experiments, as we would call them, uh, working with the various partners and stakeholders in the ecosystem to develop things that are really viable in, uh, in markets. Next slide, please. Benefits for startups are uh, entrepreneurs, faculty, researchers, and students are, again, access to that talent uh, that can accelerate development. Uh, to the universities, it's moving intellectual property along uh, rapidly to significant uh, corporate entities or, or new businesses. And then uh, universities, of course, are interested in uh, graduating students with, with uh, business skills, especially in startups and entrepreneurial organizations. Uh, we see accelerating demand for this in student populations and among universities. So uh, we're excited about this opportunity because one of the things that we see is a barrier is not having significant leadership talent to form new startups. So uh, we're excited about all these things. And now I'll move it along to uh, uh, Stephen and Michael to talk more about these, uh, these from the uh, corporate perspective. Thank you.
<clears throat> so uh, are we um, showing our screen? Okay, here we go. Jeez, what's going on here? <laughs> We're having a little technical problem here, sorry. Okay, we sh uh, are we sharing our screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, I see it now. Okay, okay, something uh, got a little out of kilter. Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, I'm Michael Blaustein. I'm pleased to be here today uh, with my colleague Steve Freilich to talk about uh, partnering between um, startups and, and large companies. And um, little disclaimer: the the the, uh, the title implies that we're only going to talk about Fortune 500s and how they think about partnering, but it's going to be a little bit more um, bi-directional than that as we get into it. So there are two main uh, uh, topics we're going to structure the webinar around. The first is uh, portfolio management. And this is from a the Fortune 500 or large corporations perspective um, and, and uh, the ways that uh, corporate portfolio management, innovation portfolio management impacts um, uh, uh, collaborations and partnerships with startups. In the second part of the uh, webinar, we will um, touch on um, some pretty granular considerations about the partnering itself between um, corporations and the Fortune 500s. And this part may be a little bit of bias towards um, advice for uh, the startups. A couple of key messages that we're going to um, hope to deliver over the course of the discussion. Um, first is that large companies do view partnerships with startups as an element of their innovation portfolio strategy. That's why it's important to understand how they uh, think about bringing uh, startups in, into the mix. Um, second point is that it's important for startups to understand, to really figure out the role for large company partnerships in their development plan. Um, and so we'll, we'll give some uh, examples of the possibilities and uh, touch on some of the points that could uh, influence the, the choices there. The last point, maybe is the most important one uh, on this slide, is that there are imbalances inherent to these partnerships, which really have to be addressed through uh, proper design and execution. What I'm thinking about here is the difference between a large company view and a startup's view about a specific partnership. From a large company's point of view, one partnership is a very small part of a very large story, very small overlap uh, between the startup and the large company from the large company's point of view. But on the other side, for a startup, this partnership could be a really critical, a key, major part of their uh, development effort. And, um, while it's still just a small issue for the large company. So I think we need to recognize as we uh, structure these partners, partnerships, that these views are different and hopefully we'll give you some insight on how to manage um, this imbalance as we go through the discussion. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Steve now for uh, the portfolio discussion. Thanks, Michael. And, and as Michael said, what I'm gonna be doing is, is um, spending a little bit of time talking about how large companies think about their portfolios in light of the realities of the business world today. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is fairly universal and cuts across all value chains. But when I give data, those data are going to be specific to the industries that I'm most familiar with uh, based on my experience in the materials and chemical value chains. Michael talked about this overlap and, and, and how that partnership is, imbalance is different. Hopefully one of the things you'll be able to take away from uh, my nuggets here is that there are ways and mechanisms that you can bring to bear that are going to really lock down that overlap, uh, even if it's a small one within the overall spectrum of the opportunity space within the portfolio of that large company. So for starters here, let's begin to to talk about how uh, large technology companies need to think about the science basis for what they do. If you're a successful science-based company, you've really got to have three characteristics. The first of these is that you have to be able to and be comfortable with managing uncertainty. You need to have a balanced portfolio and you need to accept the fact 
that within an uncertain portfolio, more often than not, there is going to be failure. Now, uh, the second piece is that the first step in innovation is the acquisition of new information. So companies have to have, be able to both sense and then absorb, learn, and ultimately create something new from that information to actually convert information into knowledge. And the third component to this is that that knowledge needs to be integrated across the development uh, process within that company, all the way from research to invention, prototyping, scaling, marketing, manufacturing, ultimately supporting the product in, in sales. You've got to be able to do that because that's what drives change. That's what creates something new and builds new platforms. Unfortunately, uh, in many value chains, the markets have not been particularly kind. Uh, we've seen this in our own behavior, both as consumers and as, um, and as observers of the markets. Commoditization is happening very, very quickly. If you look at the, uh, at the graph on the lower left of this chart, what you see is the combined profitability over a 10-year period of time from 04 to 2014 for materials and chemicals companies. And what you notice is, yeah, there's been increased profitability, but when you take that squeezing of the margins out, that profitability by and large has been the result of advantage feedstocks, which means lower price raw materials being fed in. That's not good to the long-term health of the business. And so Fortune 500 companies then tend to look at their R&D expenditure, not as an investment, but more in terms of a cost. And that's not a completely irrational decision because if you look at the chart on the right, what you see for the same industries, a survey of 90 companies in the chemicals and materials markets, in the technology-based innovation blocks, which are sort of by definition where technology familiarity is low, where you can bring something new to bear, not only are the times to commercialization very long, and the times I'm giving there are average times, they could be as long as 18 to 20 years in the upper right, um, but you, you have to think about the amount of cash that's going to be required to feed into those developments to keep them vital for so long, and the probabilities of success are quite low. So in reality, it's hard to maintain the status quo of a situation where you've got high costs, low probability of success, long-term expenditure of that, uh, and then at the same time, rapid commoditization, which means you may have that product commoditized long before it, it equals the amount of time in the market to the amount of time it took to develop. But what are companies doing in response to this? Well, they got to give in to the market pressures. And externally, what they say is they're becoming more focused. What does that mean internally? Well, for starters, it means that there is more of a short term mentality about where they're placing their investments. The second is that focus means they become less diversified and set uh, a, an aspiration to maintain their diversity level kind of where they are today. What that means for new things coming in is that there's less in, um, opportunity in the white space now. There are fewer businesses that are operating uh, where, within that individual corporation where you can find new opportunities between the businesses. The uncertainty that something new brings in means that it's much more challenging now uh, to, to move beyond the existing businesses. But while you won't necessarily see the research budget slashed to near zero, as I sort of implied on the previous chart, what you find is the research shift now moves from creating the new more towards application development because that's supporting the short-term strategy that, that goes into place with this focus. Then companies can turn around and say, well, look, let's, let's re-examine that chain that we have here from research all the way uh, to commercialization. And let's be very, very careful about how much we do in that front end. So reducing or eliminating the front end functions supports a, a short-term strategy and short-term sales, but it violates those three tenets that we talked about at the beginning for what are the characteristics of a science-based uh, business. In essence, what you're doing is you're breaking that connection between discovery and commercialization. You're saying, if I'm using my existing products, 
and services and, and uh, existing value chains, I actually don't need that, that front end anymore. And so from a startup, you can say, well, that sounds really promising because now there's a driving force for what I have. I can help be your, your front end. And that certainly is true. And it's one of the points we need to, to, to uh, keep in, in front of us here as we think about the, the value of what can be delivered. But the flip side of that is when you eliminate that front end or refocus the front end into other activities, it reduces the ability of these companies to sense what's going on in the outside. And even if they sense it, the ability to incorporate it across their functions and begin to compete with this existing strategy becomes more and more difficult. Now that doesn't sound particularly promising from a startup perspective, but I think what it, what it says is if you want to gain access to these organizations, when you recognize this reality that I just outlined, you can prepare for it. And that actually creates tremendous opportunity because businesses are now essentially crying for help. They need to know that you're there. They need to have a mechanism that says this thing that's going on outside is, is in front of me enough that I can know how I can begin incorporating it into my work. You've got to be able to help them leverage the cost. They have to be able to see the benefit that they can generate from the cost that you have already put into what you're doing. That saves them on what ha would have been their front end R&D. And the further down the chain you can go in these developments, the greater uncertainty reduction you're going to be able to build in, and that's going to be helpful. Now, the companies are out there calling for help. They say they need this help, but they often struggle with the help that you want to provide. Because when you're a startup, uh, the, the core of what you're doing is bringing something new, which from us on the outside sounds really cool, but on the inside, it feels disruptive. And when you have something in a big corporation that's disruptive, it actually can trigger a pretty significant immune response from existing businesses. That, that generates a pushback on, on what we're calling here the company's momentum strategy. That's all on the left-hand side. If you want to bring something in that sweet spot where you're, you're pushing against that momentum strategy, the word momentum is there for a good reason. You also have to recognize that companies have processes that help manage decisions that they make. And one of the key things about a process is that it's there to maintain consistency. That process keeps, uh, um, keeps challenges to consistency from actually happening. By the very nature of disruption, you are challenging the existing process. So what companies do is they say, look, I can't accommodate what, what I really need to accomplish in the market, what I really need to do with your technology through my existing processes and through my existing momentum strategies. That means I need to structure something entirely different or largely different, and that requires senior management oversight. I cannot emphasize that enough. In places where disruption is the goal, strong senior management commitment has got to be there to not only help the development stay on track and, and do that in the face of these standard process challenges, but also to protect against the antibodies that an organization has built up against change. So when companies are looking at new opportunities, quite often the key question, regardless of the value chain, regardless of whether it's an internal or an external opportunity space, the key questions that they ask are, can we do it? And if we can do it, should we do it? So there's a set of criteria that companies use, and this is just my view of what I use when I was making these decisions, but in talking to colleagues across uh, value chains, you all get the feeling that these are fundamentally the same questions for everybody. You have to start asking the question of, can I manage this? Can I set up a structure that's going to be able to allow this to be nurtured, but at the same time not destroy my ability to function with my existing businesses? Am I going to be able to staff this for success in the future? Am I going to be able to develop the capabilities or acquire the capabilities? Not just from a couple of people in a startup, but what am I going to need to go from end to end? How technically unique is what this company is bringing me or what I'm developing internally? It's more than just having a patent. It's about having that 
sustainable IP position that both gives you freedom to operate and gives you the assurance that you're going to be able to build a platform out of this new disruptive uh, opportunity. And as I mentioned, this requires business support, but it's not just somebody who has a business director or business leader title. You need to understand who in the company is going to own this development because that's the question that's being asked in the board room as well. Because the next set of questions are all about interfacing with the market and somebody's got to make sure that that's done in a comprehensive and thorough fashion. We need to understand how well vetted that business model is and how compatible is it with the brand promise of the existing businesses. Um, we need to understand how well defined that value proposition is against the next best alternative. If I had one, one thing that I see most startups uh, trip over, it's that issue of what the next best alternative is to solve the problem in the marketplace, as opposed to the next best alternative that's doing exactly the same thing that you are doing in your startup. And finally, we have the question of validation in the market. Have you done this validation through words? Have you done polls? Have you, have you surveyed people? Or have you actually developed a prototype that you've taken into the market where a customer or a potential partner in the marketplace is looking at it and say, yeah, this is exactly what I want, not just in terms of solving the difficult problem, but where the table stakes issues have also been resolved. So if you think about what I said at the beginning, when the front end of corporations be, becomes atrophied, the further along that chain you can bring them through the work that you've done, the easier time you're gonna have breaking down the barriers to the disruption that you're trying to lead. So in conclusion, in this portion, um, what I hope I've been able to tell you is that, yeah, they're really compelling forces that are beginning getting to shift Fortune 500 companies to get more and more involved in externally sourcing innovations, particularly in science-based um, businesses. And while there are a whole lot of challenges that are involved in that, there are also a lot of opportunities if you understand the challenges and how those challenges connect with the corporate strategy, how you can play together in, in helping the businesses govern um, and select those externally sourced innovations. Um, you've got to be aware of the connections between strategy and process, and you have to inter align your interactions accordingly, depending upon the extent of disruption to that strategy that you're bringing. And finally, there are some sort of universal issues that have to be resolved for any program evaluation, whether it's inside the company or outside, and recognizing that you're going to be competing with both internal and other external opportunities. Um, you, can, you can do a lot to help change the management mindset that's going to drive the selection of your opportunity versus others. So Michael, I'd like to turn it over to you for uh, more specifics. Great. Well, thanks, Steve. And um, so I think now you have a sense of you know, what makes the attraction of, of by a, a Fortune 500 company uh, to bring a startup in, into the portfolio. I'm going to try to uh, cover some of the, the nuts and bolts of, of how this all works. And, and it it should start by, um, from, a, from a, a startup company's point of view, you know, understanding why um, you might want to be in a partnership. So you know, I think there's some, some clear potential benefits um, to a startup. Um, market insight is one. Um, so as Steve talked about, value proposition validation. I mean, um, if you can attract interest from a startup, it's validating um, what you believe about the market, and I think gives you access to additional market insight. Another uh, potential there is an early customer, or at least an early evaluator of, of your uh, product or service. So another kind of validation of, of your um, offering. Uh, I think as um, uh, in, in, in a higher evolved partnership, Ships, you start to get access to expertise from uh, from the company, perhaps resources, uh, uh, um, access to some of the company's infrastructure to do work, um, and then potentially um, access to intellectual property that can enhance uh, your overall development. And then, of course, there's always the uh, financial support, um, income in terms of uh, support for research and potentially an investment. Um, uh, when I was leading a corporate venture capital, I, I, I always told my colleagues in the businesses, money is always on the table when you're 
talking to a startup because they always need money. So the financial support is always um, part of the uh, equation. But what are some of the trade-offs, right? So um, in that diagram at the beginning, I, 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 I uh, um, uh, indicated that from a startup, a partnership with a, with a large company can consume a lot of your bandwidth. And um, so it demands on time, time and, and resources, as well as then the f reduced flexibility to go do other things, have other partnerships or other internal initiatives. Um, I think there can be a perception internal to the company, but also importantly by um, some of your early investors that you're lost uh, some independence and control of your destiny. And um, that's, of course, financial investor skepticism about the impact of a large company relationship on, on their financial returns and your exit possibilities. So we need to uh, deal with these uh, trade-offs as we design the, the partnerships. So in the next um, couple of minutes, I'm going to uh, touch on uh, five elements of partnerships. First, again, understanding the purpose, how you would attract and select a partner um, once you've figured out what type of partner you want, a little bit on structures and agreements, uh, some important thoughts, I think, on, on partnership dynamics, what it's like to work with the Fortune 500 company, and then the exit dynamics. These are the exits for your company and how the partnership um, might impact that. So on this chart here, um, call your attention to the uh, that diagonal boxes moving from the uh, lower left to the upper right. Uh, these are, are um, some potential types of partnerships that um, a startup could enter into with the bigger company. As I mentioned earlier, an evaluator of your product and services. Um, um, getting feedback on, you know, does it work? Uh, I think there's also the potential for um, some early customer supplier relationships. Um, so an early customer for your uh, product or, or offering. And um, also, sometimes you may have the opportunity to um, get supply of, say, raw materials or, um, uh, or, or some uh, converting work done by a company partnership. So they can be a supplier and a customer of yours. I think then the next level of sophistication or intensity is really around co-development. So here you can think about things like a joint development agreements that um, where you might actually be anticipating co-invention. So there's complexity here around managing intellectual property. There could be a licensing, cross-licensing of technology. Um, so co-development, I think, is a is a a, 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 a a substantial and sophisticated level of partnering um, as you move up the uh, up up the uh, diagonal. At the end, you know, you might uh, look at the uh, at the large company as an acquirer as a part of your exit strategy. So that's down the line. Um, but if you think that's the potential of the partnership, you'll want to be um, managing. Um, the relationship accordingly. So what, the other thing I'm trying to indicate here, here is as you move up the diagonal, um, the mutual strategic commitment is increasing, both you to this large company and the large company to you, and the complexity of the relationship is increasing. And finally, the last point to make here is that, uh, as I said earlier, money is always on the table. So at any of these points, even as an evaluator, some uh, corporations will um, make uh, uh, bets on emerging companies with small investments early in their life cycle without any real strategic relationship. As you move on to co-development, you might attract uh, corporate venture capital and strategic um, investment. So your, your um, uh, ability to uh, get investment for from, from a large company, I think, starts to increase as you go up this uh, up the pathway. Next on attracting and selecting a partner, the key issue here is breaking through the noise at a large company. They just see so many opportunities. They're bombarded with, with possibilities. So what I always thought of when I was on the corporate side is when I'm looking at a startup, um, I'd ask the question, in three to five years, where do we want to be with this, with this company if they're successful? And then what do we need to do today to get on that journey? I think startups need to recognize that this is a question 
that they have to provide the answer to and start to plant the seeds in their relationships for, for uh, how uh, the partnership could evolve over, uh, over a time frame that's meaningful to the, uh, to the, uh, the corporate partner. Um, I think uh, I would call your attention to some of the success criteria uh, Steve talked about earlier and recognize that when you're pitching um, your company to a, to a, a Fortune 500, they're going to be looking at all the usual things, team, technology, IP, value proposition, and how it's been validated. Um, but in the context of how, again, it fits into the portfolio and how capable your team is to pull it off. Um, and finally, um, that management commitment that, that Steve uh, men mentioned earlier. Uh, is your potential partner really committed um, to uh, your team, your business as part of their strategy? So structures and agreements, uh, there's a lot of complexity here. You know, they have to be driven by the partnership purpose and the strategy. It's definitely an area of your investor sensitivity. Um, anytime you have an agreement that could be, uh, you know, perceived as giving something away. So start with some pretty basic stuff, confidential information. I, I've seen the discussion of whether it should be a one-way or two-way confidential agreement actually, you know, be, become challenging at the very beginning. Sometimes a large company won't want it to be two ways because they don't want to tell you anything. And they want to make sure their people know that they're not going to tell you anything. So you, you need to be sensitive and aware of, of these kinds of things can happen. Another issue is cross-contamination. If the fact is that if, if, if a large company is interested in you, there's a connection to their strategy and how they're thinking about their portfolio. They may be working on elements of the technology or adjacent technologies or competing technologies. So there's this issue of cross-contamination and, and I think both uh, sides need to be aware of this. And then something as basic as protection of information. Large companies, if they do tell you stuff, want to be assured that you know how to keep confidential information confidential. It's an issue that, um, that, you, know, that you, you might be challenged on. Licensing uh, can be part of the relationship. Obviously, uh, some of the dimensions there are the geographic or around a specific field of use. Exclusivity in, in some slice of, uh, of the field of use or, or geography could be um, uh, a concern. And again, think about it from both directions from the startup to the company, for sure. But is there technology the company has that can enable the startup and so sort of cement that uh, bi-directional relationship? Around joint developments, um, I think uh, there are opportunities for startups to get paid for work that they do for companies, so help to fund some of the research. Um, of course, issues that come out of this will be ownership of inventions, so great, clear agreements are uh, really critical around that. And I've seen um, on the corporate side where we ran into trouble is when we really weren't as clear. We thought we were clear about milestones and deliverables by both parties. And then a couple of years down the line, we ended up in a debate on that point. So I can't emphasize how important it is to quantify, specify uh, milestones and deliverables. The last um, uh, batch of agreements really is around equity. Um, you need to think about the startup of your business model if you're trying to attract equity investment. If your business model is to basically provide a, a service or technology to as uh, many companies as possible, then you're, you're not going to likely to want to tie up with a strategic investor where your opportunity might be constrained. So um, understanding your business model and its impact on attracting investment is important. Investors will all, corporate investors will look for additional strategic rights around uh, technology or market access. Board representation, it's not a scary thing actually having a, a, a corporate um, uh, person on your, on your board or as a board observer can help bring some of those insights that you want about markets and technology into your mix. And, and of course, your, your, uh, your corporate investors I will always be challenged to participate in later rounds, um, and that, a lot of that will depend on how well the work is, is going and, and uh, how stable the corporate strategy is. A couple of points about partnership dynamics, and again, this is that imbalance. Um, startups are concerned uh, about the speed of their corporate partner and the hierarchy and decision processes that they'll need to find. And the hierarchy, you know, is the project and business team that your startup is working with, and then the business 
this unit that it's part of, and maybe another layer of corporate leadership. So there is um, complexity there, um, and um, I, I, I think you need to recognize it and uh, frankly allow extra time then um, because a, a lot of times you will not get the rapid decisions. You'll get good decisions, but not always the rapid decisions that you're looking for. Another issue that concerns startups is the corporate commitment through business cycles. So there's a downturn in the markets. Will they still fund the project? Will they still be there? Um, are, are the people I'm working with going to get um, uh, sold or laid off at the start? At, the, at the large company. So these are genuine concerns. Um, and uh, you know, the, my advice there is uh, um, look, uh, look for ways to have other options. Don't have everything tied up with your one a corporate partner. There's a belief that uh, startups lose IP control to corporations. I really don't think that's found. In fact, there was some research done uh, by uh, Tom Edwards at Temple University, it's not been published yet, that shows actually more IP flows from the large corporations to the startups than the other way around. So what are the concerns on the other side? Can the startup deliver? Do they have the capability? Um, and, and frankly, will the, will the technology work? Will the product work? Um, will they appreciate some of our corporate realities around decision making and, and, and the portfolio issues we discussed earlier? Um, will I have financial risk as an investor and finally the the viability of the startup um, through financing cycles a really key thing to a corporate is this point you can't collaborate with a startup that's gone out of business so your viability as a company is really important and and it's an area of concern so um, I um, wanted to note uh, on this and some of the other slides some of these dynamics are, are, are where our startup development officers who uh, have experience um, entrepreneurial experiences or corporate experience can really coach you through some of these um, issues in the early stages of your, your uh, collaborations last point on exit dynamics obviously as a startup and startup investors your valuation at an IPO or an acquisition is going to be critical. So we do recognize that the impact of corporate partners and investors can have on that, the, the potential for there being a perception and perhaps even a real um, compression of your value. Um, and uh, you know, financial investors, drivers are on valuation as well as the timing. Um, your relationship with the corporate can impact timing and some of the things they're trying to drive. So um, they're, they're, these uh, uh, considerations need to be, you know, well thought through as part of your um, uh, financing and, and exit plan. On the corporate uh, side, um, I think the main one to to of concern here is is really the third one. Um, what happens if the startup doesn't succeed, um, or I'm not the acquirer? What happens to the rights that I um, acquired through, say, my investment? So this will be an important point of negotiation. By a large company with 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 your startup so expect to figure out uh, have to deal with that and then um, in an exit scenario there's the potential for a corporation to buy assets versus an entire business so there there, there could be some workarounds to some of these issues so in summary um, you know positioning a startup for a partnership is tied to corporate portfolio management I think that's clear from uh, what Steve shared it centers around understanding capabilities of risks, capabilities and risks, and also understanding that the, this partnership opportunity is a program that's an opportunity for the company. And, and finally, addressing these key factors uh, to establish and execute a corporate partnership, starting with understanding the pur purpose and then finding the right partner and structuring for success consistent with that purpose and um, balancing a lot of the benefits and the various constraints necessary to keep all your stakeholders on board. So your company, the partnership we're talking about, your investors and other companies that you're working with uh, in the development of, of your business. So that's um, what we wanted to cover and uh, I guess it's time to go to Q&A. Thank you, Michael. So we do have some questions lined up here. Uh, let me see. Let's start with the first one. Just move it over. 
and we can start. Hmm. Yeah, there's something wrong. There you go. Okay. So our first question is, what percent of partnerships lead to acquisition? So who wants to take that? <laughs> I would say it's, it's relatively low. I actually don't have the data, but I think it's a relatively uh, small percentage of acquisition partnerships lead to acquisition in general. But I think if you look at what's going on in the, in the pharmaceuticals industry, um, where, uh, you know, filling the pipeline, and I'm not an expert on pharmaceuticals, uh, where, where filling the pipeline has been basically, you know, um, uh, uh, delegated to emerging companies, you'd probably see, a, 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 you know, a significantly higher than average um, acquisition from, from some of the early partnerships. I think Michael's making an important point that you know, while, the, while the question is a really good question at the general level, the answer has to be uh, down to the specific value chain a specific kind of industry. And you can get some information on that by, by looking at the uh, National Venture Capital Association's website. They've got a, a, a huge amount of data broken out by industry, and you can, you can get a feel for it there. All right, so let's go to the next question, please. Uh, all right, here's the next one. How does NSET2 startup development platform address issues of startups working um, working for big corporations or working right. with? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so um, as I um, mentioned a couple of times, but not perhaps not consistently enough, I think um, there are another there are a number of aspects of of the um, evolution of your partnership where the SDO process can help. So first of all, in terms of the partnership purpose, um, you've got uh, uh, in, in the NSET2 uh, constellation, um, corporate veterans who've um, experienced different kind of partners and partnerships, and um, I think can help advise the startups on at what point do you want more than an evaluator? When does it make sense to have a customer? And, and is something really, uh, appropriate to put into um, co-development. So I think, you know, from experience and, and working through those strategies, that's definitely an area that um, uh, we can assist on. And, you know, then in, in terms of selecting a partner, when you know the purpose and trying to figure out whether a particular company is a good partner, uh, you'll, you'll be pitching to a lot of companies. So um, you need to understand the feedback, uh, the reactions that you've gotten from the management and leadership at the companies you pitch to, and, then, and also from the teams um, you're working with. And I think that, again, sharing those experiences uh, um, with your SDOs, um, and, which, and, and uh, will, will um, help address some of those concerns. And finally, um, you know, we have experienced um, entrepreneurs who've been on that startup side of the table looking at a, at a, um, at a corporate the experience there, I think, can can really help guide you through early all these early stages of the um, of the partnering process. All right, we have another question here. What type of assistance do big corporations give researchers or inventors to develop their IP into a company? Uh, you, you can start. Okay, I'll start. So, yeah. So, I mean, in, first of all, I, I, I maybe I'll, I'll sort of rephrase the question. We're really, from a corporation's point of view, we're not interested in helping a company develop IP into a company. We're helping. A, we're interested in helping a co company develop into uh, maybe a standalone company that we have a relationship with, or into something that we might want to bring into our company. So we're more interested in developing of a, of a business than in developing IP. Now, having said that, if um, in the stage of development where you're working with a, a large company, there's additional research going on, um, and uh, th there's a possibility to contribute to IP strategy, might be one area. And as I mentioned 
there could be co-developments where you, your company, the startup and the big company are doing research together and actually develop joint IP. So I, I think some of those are some of the ways that we can touch on IP as a large company. If you think about it from the context of what I was talking about in that your, your chances of both getting noticed, being incorporated into, this, into, into a developing strategy of a big company, uh, and, and really being accepted and getting help are, are much greater. Those chances are much greater if you can move down the chain a little bit. So if, if, you're, uh, if, if what you have is an IP, which for all intents and purposes is, is an idea and not much more, but you haven't developed a prototype or you haven't uh, begun to survey the markets to really understand not just what um, secondary research tells you, but what primary research can offer you, you become less interesting to the company. And that, that's uh, one important take home message. But if on the other hand, you are doing work that is now uh, published in the literature or where you have a provisional patent that's been published, where uh, the, the companies can see this and they say, hey, we are interested in what you have because it fits into a strategy that we have. In other words, on the left-hand side of that momentum strategy chart, then you might be able to get some, some assistance. But at that point, don't expect that to be high-level management assistance. Think about it more in terms of somebody who's doing that kind of work already is interested in that work, and you might be able to, to help and fit in. Very, very different dynamics and very different kinds of interactions. All right, thank you. So I'm pulling up the next question here. Can you give me an idea of odds of partnering with a large company? How many startups do large companies bring into their portfolio per year? As we said earlier, um, it, it depends on the, the uh, personality of the company. It depends on uh, the industry in which they're working. If you're dealing with a commodity chemical company, chances are they're not going to be bringing much in unless you have something that's going to be able to show them how to dramatically reduce their cost of manufacture. If you're dealing with uh, a company at the bleeding edge of uh, electronic materials or consumer electronics, then you're going to find that, that's a, that, that partnering with a, a startup is a really critical way that they have of making sure that they can jump ahead of the competition. So it, it really boils down to whether you're bringing something that is acquirable by a large group of, of companies or whether you're bringing something that, that is so unique that only one com company forming the relationship with you uh, can ever benefit from it. And that's the way a lot of the companies have to think about these. So the odds, the odds are going to depend on what you're bringing and who you're bringing it to and what they, what they do with stuff that they get. And that's a really crappy answer. Um, but but it's, it's the best I know from my experience in a number of different industries. And let me add one other thought. Um, uh, so it sort of depends on what you mean by bringing to the portfolio. So um, uh, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, I, I led DuPont Ventures, uh, which is our corporate venture capital group. We made relatively few investments, say two or three investments a year in a typical year. Um, but DuPont, um, we're looking across the businesses was working with many more early stage or startup companies than that multiples of that uh, sometimes with the assistance of our venture organization to help build relationships but, but there are a lot of ways to um to partner that you know are not sort of big portfolio moves in terms of an investment so um and i i'm uh, i'm sure that that mix varies a lot by type of industry, the type of the value chain as, as well. Plus company personality is a big factor. And when, when I was at DuPont trying to do something that was going to be disruptive to the DuPont strategy, one of the first things that I would do would be to go out and see uh, other small companies who were doing similar things where I could begin to place some, some options bets, uh, either watching what they were doing or just bringing them in so I could get the expertise that I didn't have so it, it really has to be thought of both vertically and horizontally. Yeah. Uh, what am I trying to do out there in the market? And then what do I need in order to accomplish uh, my goal that I, that I can't do on my own? 
So this, this is where the, the issue that I brought up at the beginning is really important. You've got to understand what you have and how, how it fits into what companies need. If all you know is what you have, it's going to be very hard to get incorporated. But once you understand what, what your potential partner on the other side of the table is struggling with, then your odds are actually quite good. If you don't understand that, your odds are actually relatively small. Stephen, a uh, question from Glenn. Um, you talked about disruptors at the beginning of the presentation. I'm curious how that breaks down in terms of how you would approach a large company. What's their breakdown in terms of the disruptors that they're interested in typically, and how can you know it? Well, I, if I were answering that question 30 years ago, uh, I, I would I would be talking about particularly particular industries where disruption is ripe. Um, now you're finding fewer and fewer companies, particularly in the materials and chemical space, who are actually seeking disruption. They may talk about it, but the investment that it takes for a disruption could be somewhere on the order of a half billion dollars, and that comes directly out of profits. So where where you tend to find disruptions is where uh, you see that there are mega trends going on in the marketplace where the the needs just the, the needs are not able to be met by what exists today so you've got to look at the the intersection between what a company can do and what the mega trends are that they might be interested in and where those towering strengths of that company exist but they they need help in in taking those strengths to making dramatic changes in in one of of the global megatrends that's where you find disruption it's opportunities that are going to happen and people aren't quite sure how to make that happen perfect example of that uh, although it's it's probably a little time worn now is, is tesla they are not the first electric car company they're not the best battery company but by bringing a lot of this stuff together recognizing what the megatrend was and acquiring enough capability outside, they're able to create a package that's really quite disruptive to the entire industry. Oh, thank you. I, I wonder if for a large corporate too, uh, a disruptor would probably represent a new market and a new technology, but my sense of the corporates that I've known is that they, they don't stray too far from markets they know. It might be an adjacent market. Would you like to comment on that? Well, that was that was very much uh, the point of what I was trying to get. I think you've hit it uh, right on target. An existing business is going to have processes, people, and frankly, objectives within the corporation that really keep it at home. Uh, and anything that that challenges those is a distraction away from what they've already committed. Very few businesses are willing to step forward and say, "I'm going to commit for absolutely more than I know how to do," and I'm going to reach out to small companies to go make that happen. They're committing to the best they know how to accomplish. And anything more than that is going to be a challenge. So it, it's right to your point. Um, if you want to break out of that, you need to be able to provide a very compelling picture of how that strategy that you're going to be driving that's different is going to create a disproportionate growth opportunity for the company. They're going to have to invest by telling one of the existing businesses Thanks for playing. You're now going to spin off cash so I can do this other thing. Thanks. All right. So we've run out of time, and I think we're about ready to close this webinar. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Steve, for joining us today. And thank you, Glenn, for um, facilitating the discussion. Um, so thanks, everyone. Um, as I mentioned earlier today, the slides and video will be available in 24 to 48 hours after the webinar concludes. So watch out for an email from us uh, letting you know where you can access the slides and the video as well as the archives for past webinars in this series. Now for those universities on the call, researchers um, who have IPR startups and you would like to see if your IPR startup is a good candidate for the startup development program or the startup development platform, just send us an email at startupdevelopment at nset2.org so we can send you a copy of the application forms to prepare you for the next round of submissions in, in, a, in a few weeks. Then um, for those who'd like to be 
like to become startup development officers, basically working with us to develop IP into startups or startups uh, move startups forward, then just send us an email, the same email address as well. Um, being an STO is open to ex-corporates, serial entrepreneurs, and active angel investors. We think that you'll find um, our development model quite intriguing. So send us an email and we'll give you a call so we can discuss. All right. So again, thank you very much, everyone, our audience and our speakers for joining us today. Have a good afternoon and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.